This morning I want to talk about the rapture and why does it matter. Uh, and it does matter. And it matters a lot about how we live our lives and, and what we think and, and uh, it affects our future. Uh, and to give you a little background on my own history, I originally... Uh, I think in 1970, Hal Lindsey came out with a book. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was very popular at the time, and, and I read it. And so I read it, and I thought, okay, well, that's, that's the way it is. And I just assumed it was. And that was my viewpoint. But then as I began to uh, get into the scriptures later and begin to do research and, and search it out, uh, I found out that my viewpoint has definitely changed. And the word rapture is actually an extra-biblical word. It's not in the, the word itself. The concept is, which just means being caught up with the Lord. And there's three main kind of positions, one being the pre-tribulation rapture, uh, the second being some, the mid-tribulation, and then uh, also the tribulation at the end, or the, the rapture at the end of the tribulation. And again, as I was uh, kind of brought up and just assumed that, you know, this is the way it was. And, but then after I began to do research, I began to find out, well, really, that, it, that wasn't the, the background of the church. The classical church position was a post-trib rapture. And I found out that it was actually not until the 1830s when a man by the name of Darby, uh, who was a member of the Brethren Church, really began to bring this forward, uh, the, the pre-trib so I want to get our, our understanding from the Bible, and not from a book or not from a movie, but from what the Word of God says. So we're going to go through quite a few scriptures. I probably have 20 different references here that I want to look at, uh, and then I want to get at the end to why that matters. So in Matthew 24, this is one you will hear quite a bit. talking about that people will use for the, for the, for the pre-trib uh, rapture. And it makes a, you know, kind of sounds like a good story. That's in verse 41, 40, 40 and 41 of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, again, is, a, is the end time chapter where it talks about the signs of the times. So if you turn over to verse 40 and 41, it says, Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. So if you've seen some movies, you've seen some things on, you know, reading, yeah, two men are in the field, one is taken, one is left, you know, and, and many people say, well, okay, that, that's the rapture. Uh, John uh, Valvord, who was the actually president of the Dallas Theological Seminary, who was also one of the leading proponents of the pre-rapture theory, he said, no, we cannot use that verse for that, because if you look at the corresponding verse in Luke chapter 17, so turn over to Luke chapter 17, and it's going to be verses uh, 34 and 37. And again, we we'll have to kind of go through these fairly quickly just because we have so many of them. But 34 says, I tell you, this is, of course, Jesus speaking again. I tell you on the night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Verse 37, where, Lord, they ask. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So basically it's saying that that's a rapture you don't want to be part of. It's actually that the evil ones are removed, the dead bodies. Like this morning, I, uh, uh, I had a little issue going on with uh, some raccoons. Uh, and I uh, had caught one Friday night, and I caught another one this morning. Uh, they'd been in one time, well, actually a week or two ago, caught one in the corn, sweet corn patch. Uh, this one, we have a couple different 
apple trees, and one tree had almost been, even though the, the apples are green, they've almost been one whole side cleared off. So I moved my cage, caught it. Caught again this morning, caught another one. And uh, if they're eating my corn or if they're eating my peaches or eating my apples, there's only one sentence, and that is the death sentence. <laughs> so <clears throat> after I uh, double-tapped him, so I, I take him out right next to the, the house. There's a, there's a field there, and I dump him there. Okay, by the time I get home this afternoon, there's going to be probably four, five, six vultures that are going to be having lunch. So that's where the bodies go. So that is not something you really want to be a part of. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, I want to give you a couple of examples of that. Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. And this is about the parable of the weeds. And Jesus has given him a parable. And he says, Then he let, he let the crowd and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Now he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. Now the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now drop down to verse 47, same, same chapter. It's a parable of the nets. And it says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Now, when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, again, we have a, another example. Now, does that mean there's... There's not a rapture, a catching up. Yes, there is. And we're going to get to that if you turn to 1 Thessalonians. It's just that sometimes we use verses that really don't mean what sometimes people say they mean. So all your T's are together right before Timothy, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. Again, a very... Very familiar verse regarding the coming of the Lord. And Paul says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or to grieve. And when he talks about they're falling asleep, it's not, it's not meaning they're taking a nap. It means they have died. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, according to the Lord's own words. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with a loud voice of the archangel, angel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So, and there's 
in that passage, there are a couple different things. There's a one, of course, Christ appears in the air. Uh, there's a loud voice, loud voices. There's a trumpet. Uh, the dead Christians arise and get their resurrected bodies. And the live Christians are caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Now, upon death, it says, you know, to be separate from the body, your spirit goes immediately. If you were to die, if the spirit was to leave your body right now, your body would just crumble. Your spirit goes to be with the Lord. You don't need a, you don't need a body in heaven, but you do need a body to function on planet Earth. And we will get a new, improved, much upgraded model that will never age, that will never grow old, that will never have disease, no sickness. But the key passage or the key word in that passage is in verse 17. It says, to meet the Lord in the air. Now that word, to meet the Lord in the air, is a Greek word, apatius. It's a p a n. T-E-S-I-S, which is uh, number 529 in the Strong Concordance. So if you want to look that up later. Now, it only occurs in two other places in the New Testament. We're going to look at those. But what it means is that the principal person or the dignitary is coming. Okay, you need to picture this, the, the, which in our Christ would be Christ. But the, the dignitary is coming. The people are coming to meet him. The dignitary does not turn around and go in the opposite direction. The people turn around and they escort him into, and in this case, it's, it's the Lord that's coming. So to give you a couple examples, there's only two other places, and one of them is in Acts 28. So if you go ahead and turn there, it's the example of Paul as he's coming into towards Rome as a prisoner. In verse 14 and 15, chapter 28. Okay, verse 14, Then we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. Now the brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the form of Apias and the three taverns to meet us. So Paul is coming. He's the principal character. He's the dignitary that's coming. These people, Christians from Rome, have come out to meet him. So you need to picture this. So they're coming out to Rome to meet him. They don't just keep going. They turn around and, and are going the same direction that Paul is going into Rome. Now, the only other uh, example of that word, the only one in the New Testament is in uh, Matthew 25. And let's tell you that that's the story about the ten virgins, you know, the five wise virgins and the, and, the, and the five unwise virgins. And it gives that same example as the bridegroom is coming, the virgins go out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, so they go out to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom, when he gets there, he doesn't turn around and go back. Again, that's representing Jesus coming back. The virgins turn around, and they go with him into the wedding feast. So there's only three times that Greek word is used. So it's very important to understand what the meaning is. Now let's go back to Second Thessalonians this time. Chapter 2, Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And this is talking about what we refer to as the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness. Verse 1, it says, Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy or report or a letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. 
Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs or the great falling away. And the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple and proclaims himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of a lawless one is with, is with accordance with the work of Satan, displaying all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe a lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but who have delighted in wickedness. So he says there's two things that are happened before the day of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord. And that is the apostasy or the great falling away. And that the lawless or the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will be revealed. I mean, it won't be a guessing game. It will be you will know that this person is him that he's sitting on the throne, that he's proclaiming himself to be God. Now, just turn probably a page back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, last chapter in that book. And we're going to look at 1 through 4. And it says, Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, how many times have you heard that? That the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. And you never know what's going to happen. Read on to verse 4. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are sons of light and sons of the day. So we, it is not supposed to take us by surprise. Now let's go back to Matthew 24. Again, that's the end times passage in the Gospel of Matthew and really, you need to read that, that whole chapter. But we're going to look at uh, a couple verses, 29. Actually, before you get to 29, I want to read verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. He says, so when you, see this, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand. So he says, when you see, you're going to see this if you are alive at the time. When you see that. But down in verse 29, Matthew 24, and it says, immediately after the distress of these days, and what he's been talking about is the great tribulation, the, the signs, the birth pangs, all that's going to be happening. It says, immediately after the distress of these days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming 
on the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So that occurs at, the, the, at a great trumpet, it says. It says, after the stress of these things, and it says, the Son of Man will appear, the tribes of the earth, the unbelievers, will be mourning, and there will be a great trumpet, which as we read in uh, Revelation, in Revelation, it would be the seventh trumpet, and the angels will gather the elect. Now we're going to go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. So this is kind of a little Bible drill. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. And this is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And verse 20 says, "But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He's the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Now Christ is the first fruit. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now stay in that same chapter, but go down to verse 50. And Paul says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does a perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immor immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So it's at the last, it says the last trumpet is when this occurs. So now we'll go to Revelation, the book of Revelation, Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelations 11, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 18. And actually, uh, in chapter 11, verse 15, is probably one of my, my favorite verses. Because it says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were a loud voice in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Glorious. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and they worship God, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and rewarding the servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who revere your name, both small and great, and for and for destroying those who destroy the earth. 
So again, he says in verse, this is the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet. There's, there's three different sets of judgments. There's the bowls, there's uh, uh, the wrath, uh, wrath of God, there's the bowls that are poured out, there's the seven trumpets and the seven seals. So 21 different judgments that are, that are poured out upon the Antichrist kingdom. One more in Revelations, and that's Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to look at verses 4 and 6. And it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped a beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. Now they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Now this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have been part of the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. So it says it is the first resurrection, which means they couldn't be, have been a, a resurrection seven years before or three and a half years before that. This is the first resurrection. Now we're going to finish out in the Gospel of John, of all places. Let's go to John chapter 6, Gospel of John. few quick verses here. First one will be John 4, 40. It says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. There's only one last day. We are in the last days, but there's only one last day throughout Scripture. Verse 44, same chapter. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, the last day. One last one in John, John chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. And this is the story uh, about the death of Lazarus. In verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Now Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never lie will never die. Do you believe this? So again, it's, it's on the last day. So what is that, what does this all matter really? Because we, you know, there's some people who, who say they're, they are uh, pan tribul or, you know, we have a pre-tribulation, a mid-tribulation, a post-tribulation, and some who say to themselves that they are pan-tribulation, meaning they didn't really don't have a, a viewpoint they just believe it's all going to pan out in the end, which, you know, which is true. It is going to pan out on the end. But it does matter what you believe because if you can picture yourself seeing the Antichrist, seeing all these things happening, seeing him in the temple proclaiming himself to be God, and you're going, I'm not supposed to be here. I was supposed to be raptured. Is your faith going to be shaken? 
will that cause you to stumble? Revel- I told you it was the last script. One more scripture. Revelation chapter 13. Revelations 13 and verses 5 through 10. It says, the beast was giving a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemy and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Now he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, every people, every language, and every nation. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all those who have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So he was given power to make war against the saints. So if, if we are alive at that time, And you see the Antichrist, and it seems, from what we are seeing, and the evidence is that it looks like he is winning. He conquers, he makes war against the saints, and he conquers them. Now, if you don't know that, you may be shaken. You may be going, wait, what's happening here? I thought we were going to be gone. I thought the Lord would rescue all of us, and we'd be automatically raptured earlier. So that is my concern is that godly men and, you know, men and women believe all three of those different scenarios. But my concern is that if you're not prepared and you begin to see those things happening, will your faith be shaken? Will your faith be shipwrecked? I want to read you a, a quote from Corey Ten Boone. Most of you should know who she is, great. And if you don't, you need to know who she is. Uh, a great story of hiding the Jews. Sister was killed in a concentration camp. She said, I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told Don't worry. Before the tribulation comes, you will be raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Turning to me, he said, You still have time. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, and how to stand and not faint. So our missionaries at the time when when Mao was coming in and the Civil War was going in on China, and as the communists took over, people were told, the Christians were told, you're going to be raptured before it gets really bad. And instead, truly, millions were, were killed for their faith. And even today, whether it's China, whether it's the Middle East, Christians are persecuted. Pers- Christians are being, uh, having their property taken away. They're being persecuted. We, we in America really have never, I mean, honestly, never been persecuted. We don't know what persecution is. We think if someone makes fun of us because of our belief that we're persecuted, and we don't really have a clue. And I don't know why, you know, it's, it's kind of like we think, well, well, Americans were, you know, that would never happen here. And it can very well happen here. And I think as we see the signs of the times, we see the birth pangs that are happening, we're going to start seeing more and more of that. And that's why our faith needs to be set and again, it's not bad news, but I have to tell you the bad news for we can grasp the good news because 
The good news is, Revelation 11, 15, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forevermore. But you have to know before that, there are some very dark times. But he will give us the strength. He will give us the grace. You know, you don't need a miracle until you need a miracle. And he will uphold us. But if we, if, we don't, if we have the wrong concept, if we have the wrong thinking, we could, we could be in a place where we could be shaken, that we could lose our faith, where we, we would think, well, this was not how I thought it was supposed to happen, and begin to question God. And the biggest thing would be offense at God. Why God? Why are you allowing this to happen? How can you do this? How either offended at what he does or offended at what he doesn't do. But we need to have our faith set on a strong foundation, knowing we know the end of the story. We win. There's going to be some battles that we lose, but we win the war. So let's go ahead and stand. It may seem like somewhat of a, a negative teaching, but, it, but I think it's one we, we need to have ingrained. And I would just challenge you all. I, I've always challenged people, give me one verse that tells me that I'm going to be raptured before the tribulation. And I haven't found anyone yet to give me that one verse that tells me that. So I would just encourage you, search the Scriptures out yourself, Read the Word, and then just see what it begins to speak to you about. It's not a point of, of bringing division between different beliefs. It's just that you read the Word, you get it for yourself, and you know where you stand on that Word. All right. So we want to take some time now for the body, kind of to minister to the body. So anyone who has a, a prayer request... Uh, be sure, let's raise your hand, whether it's a, uh, something for physical healing or maybe it's a financial thing or maybe it's a relationship, whatever it might be. Raise your hand, and we're going to gather people around, and we're going to pray and believe God that God's going to do a mighty work because he is faithful. And that's, that's one thing that we can take assurance in. Despite the darkness that is, that is steadily encroaching upon us, you know, that Isaiah 60, that, that arise and shine, that it's in those times when the power of God is revealed. So again, if you have any need, whether it's a physical healing, whether it's a, a financial need, whether it's a relationship, whatever it is, just raise your hand. Okay, there's one. Anybody else? Okay, in the back, Taylor back here. Okay, everybody look around. Anybody else? Okay, there's Greg Smith back here in the back. All right, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and Nathan, if you can give us kind of some little bit of uh, background music and worship. Some of us will worship, but the rest of us, let's gather around those who need the prayer and let's pray and let's believe and let's see God's hand move. His, his arm is not too short. He's a supernatural God that does supernatural things. And the body needs to minister to the body. Each one of you has been deputized to pray and to believe God. So let's take our part.